to say that the most, the most important thing or aspect of your whole Christian life is, you want to fill in the rest of it? You know what it might be? Well, you might be surprised. I believe we're well within scriptural boundaries to say that there's nothing more important in your Christian life than the three or so hours that you spend with the other saints right here whenever we gather together. There's really nothing more important than that because everything you do throughout the rest of the week is based upon what you've learned, what you've experienced, what you've seen or observed whenever you spent two or three or four or however many hours together with the saints here worshiping God and being taught the word. Over in Matthew 18, verse 20, <clears throat> Jesus says it's so solemn that he'll make sure he puts in an appearance whenever two or three are gathered together in his name. True sheep who desire to be overcomers will center their entire life around the local assembly. Amen. And they'll identify with all of its ministry and all that it stands for. Amen. Ever charged or accused of being too wrapped up in your church? Yep. Well, that's, that's a good charge then. Amen. Because the true, sheep who, the true sheep who desire to be overcomers will identify completely and totally with the local assembly here and everything that it does and everything that it stands for. That's why there's no sense in a young people's program or an old people's program, we have to all identify with the local assembly. And since we're not all, all old and young at the same time, we all couldn't identify with those things. The church has its program split up into different categories of different special item and special group people. And the Bible doesn't expect for us to and doesn't require us to split the church up like that because then we couldn't all identify with everything going on there. Amen. But when you have everyone involved in everything, there's no special people for bus ministry or special people for witnessing. When you have everyone involved with everything, then you have a corporate unity. You have a total... Uh, spiritual structure where people gather together under Jesus' name. Matthew 18 and verse 20. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What we're emphasizing is the fact that there's nothing more important in your Christian life than the time you spend right here. You might have guessed something else when I started off, but now you see that that's, that's it because everything else that you might think is important is based upon what you've learned or experienced right here. You just can't rough it on your own out there. You gain strength and vitality and not to speak of knowledge of the word and faith and so forth when we gather together here. That's why we do it four times a week. And uh, our whole life is centered around, I assume that if you're a true sheep desiring and wanting and confessing to be an overcomer, you will be the same way. Our whole life is centered around getting to come here and meet. Amen. And you see, everyone else has their life centered around something else. And if they give religion a place at all, it's just that, a place over to the side or back in the back somewhere. And it's not right in the middle and right in the center of everything they do. We preached a message a long time ago called local identification where we were showing you from 1 Corinthians 12 and we'll probably be back there this morning that the body, in order to be a part of the body, you have to identify with everything the body stands for and whenever the body meets together. There's no such thing as an isolated member set apart somewhere by itself and that everything you do even when you're not here gathered together with us, cast a reflection back upon the church. Amen. Where you work, what you say, what you do, where you go, what type of friends you have. You know, I can hardly imagine having any friends outside of the people right here. Amen. I get a little suspicious when I hear someone, them and their friend, and I want to know who it is, and they tell me who it is, and I've never heard of them before. I think your friend... 
Well, obviously, they don't believe everything that we believe here. They'd be here. If they're a friend of yours, y'all go places together, do things together. Why aren't they here then? Well, it's because there's some things, you know, that you knew, know that they wouldn't believe. Then are they really your friend? They couldn't be mine. Oh, they might be an acquaintance, a next-door neighbor, uh, someone you work with that you chat with, but a friend. How could you have a friend outside people right here in this church? There's a big selection of them. If you don't have any friends, just pick a few out because it's not like we're a one-family church with only six people here or something, and you don't have a very big selection for friends. That wouldn't hurt you either, but you've got a big selection of friends out there. Why would people want some lost, unregenerate friend out there in the world? I'm talking about for a friend. I'm not talking about you ought to be concerned about them and their salvation and so forth. I'm talking about a friend or even a non-charismatic charismatic. How could you want someone like that for a friend that you spend time with? I don't know. I'm a little suspicious when I hear about people who have friends like that. And I wonder, where are they missing it then? They're missing something about the identification they're to have with the body. Because this is where they should be drawing all of their friends and all of their life right here. So you can ask yourself the question, is your whole life centered around our gathering together? Now, that might sound like a false cult, but it's the early church pattern, the book of Acts. They live together, Acts 2, verse 44. They live together, Acts chapter 4. That's how together they were. And we don't do that. And so whether people call us a cult or not is really beside the point because they did more than we do back in Acts 2 and 4. And whether they got called a cult back then was probably beside the point because there were a lot of other religious sects and groups around, but they knew that that was what you had to do to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the denominational system and the charismatic movement is not built upon these precepts. Because you come to church, you hear a sermon, and you go home. And perhaps some people look forward to coming back to church, but it's probably an underlying social reason why they look forward to coming back to church, or perhaps a business reason, some business partner or friend or client of theirs in church. But is your whole life and what you do during the week centered around the nights, the mornings that we have meetings here to be able to get back together again? Well... Uh, that's the only way it can be in this church, friends. That's the only way it can be. It's not that way some places, but that's the only way that it can be here. Everything has to be centered around. Everything in your life has to be centered around. You see, the church is not an extracurricular activity of yours during the week. It's everything. Anything else you do, hunting, fishing, chasing little white balls around the golf course, whatever it is you do, those are what we call extra curricula or extra church activities, and they're fine to do as long as you don't take off from church to do those all the time and can hardly wait to get through with church to go do whatever it is you want to do. You should be wanting to get through with that so you can get back to church again. Those are your extracurricular activities. Work happens to be one of them. Extracurricular activity. That's something outside of the church. The church, you don't get life from working. You get all of your spiritual life from right here when we gather together. So this is the center point and the focal point. And whatever you do, keep house, work, play, whatever you do, all of them are extracurricular, extra church activities. You just work to make a living so you can come back here and so they don't foreclose on you or take your car away from you or something. That's the only reason you do all of that. But that doesn't give you spiritual life or get you into the kingdom because you go to work or clean house or hunt and fish or play golf or basketball or whatever or have some type of peculiar hobby. We won't get into what your peculiar hobby might be. <laughs> but whatever that might be, that's all outside of what the center point should be in one's life. And you'll find that a lot of people aren't willing to submit themselves to that type of relationship and to that type of identity with the local church. And that's why they won't become a part of a place like this. Because we kind of know everything about everyone here. What's there to hide? If there's something to hide, then get saved. You shouldn't have something to hide. Repent. Get the baptism. Whatever it is that's causing you to sin that you would want to hide, what's there to hide in life? We ought to all be open and free with one another. But most people in most places don't like an atmosphere like that. 
they think that it breeds distrust rather than trust, but here it breeds trust and not distrust of one another. Uh, over in Hebrews 10, verse 25, this is one of those shocking truths about the Bible, the end time messages, total identification with the local assembly. And so if you're charged of being too wrapped up in the affairs of your church, then it's a worthy charge. Because we don't keep you busy in religious programs here. That's not a worthy charge. Some people are so busy in religious programs, they neglect their family and everything else. But uh, we teach just the opposite from that. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So here, they're not to forsake the assembling of themselves together, but they're to recognize what Jesus had said earlier in Matthew 18 and verse 20, that when they do assemble themselves together and become there at that local point, the local assembly of Christ, then Jesus promises to be there in their midst. Not that he's not other places, but he's in a special manner, in a special way present. He said it, Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in his name. Now, in Matthew 28, he said he'd never leave you or forsake you. So that must mean he's with you everywhere, but not in the same manner as when we find ourselves gathered together under his name. Then he promises to be here in a special way. And uh, you ought to look forward. That's why I look forward to the time. Because uh, you can't just generate things on your own unless you do them the way he says it. He says, I'll be there in a special way if you'll get two or three together. If you've got one, well, the promise is not for one. The promise is where you've got a plurality. And what he's talking about there, the very chapter in the preceding verses, is talking about the church. He's talking about the church there. So that's what he has reference to in verse 20. It's when the body gathers together. Then he promises to be there in a unique and a special way. The early Christians were commanded not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. And so over in Acts 2, we see them fulfilling this command not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. Acts 2, beginning with verse 41. That's why we have such a close fellowship and such a close unity and why evidently where some people go, everyone decides to go because the church and the people in the church stay together. Verse 41, And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They, in other words, people, not little souls that they gather together in boxes, but people. <laughs> well, we'll teach on that sometime. But you read King James here and you think they got a lot of souls they gather together and put them in big bins or something. Well, verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the assembly daily such as should be saved. Hallelujah. Well, this is after, of course, Peter's sermon, but if you go back to Acts 1, verses 13 and 14, when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Verse 15, And the number of the names together were about an hundred and twenty. And then over in 2.1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You can hardly get half that number in one place in one accord at the same time. They had 120 together. You can hardly get just a fraction of that number together in one place 
at one time and then all to be in one accord. The only time you'll get them all in one place at one time is on maybe Sunday morning or maybe midweek service on Wednesday night, but that doesn't guarantee that everyone's there in one accord. Amen. They had more than just, in other words, the physical gathering together. It was a spiritual gathering together. Amen. They were all with 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, one mind, one judgment, Amen. one persuasion, one outlook on life, and one future all together. Just because people gather together in one place at one time doesn't mean that they are all one at that time. Because there are bickerings and disputations that go on. And you know, we can say right now, this church, you can't always say it. It's not always true because we know there are things that have to be worked out and worked through. But we can say of this church right now that we don't have any problems at all here. Amen. Amen. You see, the Lord has dealt with some people and some he's gotten out of the church and others he's gotten changed in the church. And I'm not saying there won't be things in the future to deal with. But right now we have no problems. Amen. That's just not true in churches anywhere. There are always problems to be worked out and to be worked through. But you see, the only thing that does this is the preaching of the Word. That's what gets us all into one accord. We all have to be believing the same thing. And we are long-suffering and patient with you, and that's why we continue to teach the same things, because you don't all hear it the first time. You don't all hear it, and you don't hear it all the first time that you hear the message preached. You've heard this about unity and one accord before, time and time again. But just to hear it doesn't mean that you believe it and are practicing it. Just because people are together in the body, in the flesh, does not mean they're together in the spirit. That they are all thinking and believing and practicing the same thing. We happen to be doing that right now. It's something that you have to continue to work on. And you see, there's nothing anyone else can do for you. You have to do it yourself. And that's why it is a whole corporate movement together. We all have to bring the blessing of the Lord here with ourselves and not bring all of our problems. That's why we've said if you've got problems and can't get rid of them, just stay home that service then. You would do all of us a service by just staying home because you'll search in vain to find a proof text in the New Testament that the church is a place where you come in defeated and try to get built back up. You'll search in vain for a passage that says that. I know that's the way the church presents it. You know, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You've been broken down by the devil all week, come in to service on Sunday morning. And that's why they have dead services. Because you're trying to revive a lot of dead people that have been defeated that week. Oh, you'll search in vain for a text that says, come in and be pumped up on Sunday morning. Come in and have something to offer to give to everyone else on Sunday morning. You can find plenty of passages that say that from one chapter in the New Testament to another, you'll find that. Come in and have something worth offering to everyone or don't come at all. What if I came and says, well, I just don't have a message. I was busy this week. I was just There were trials this week. The devil was after me. I was defeated, discouraged, worried. You see, the pastor never gets to do that. He always is expected to have something. But you see, there's no division in the New Testament between clergy and laity. We're all together in this. Why is it that we expect the pastor to always be ready and to always have something to offer? But yet we don't always have to do that because, after all, we're only human. Well, he's only human too. But he's got something to offer. That would be pretty discouraging if I got here every time and said, well, we're just going to stop. I just I couldn't get a message this week. I studied lesson books, lesson plans. I just couldn't get up a lesson, though. <laughs> Yeah, you can actually buy them. You can actually rent lesson plans from someone else. They'll give you a one, two, three point and a conclusion and a few jokes to go along with it. And you pay a fee to get that from them. So I guess I could always get something. I could rent it. No, I wouldn't do it. I would just stay home that service then. I wouldn't come up here and say that I've got something to offer when really I don't have anything to offer. And all pastors are expected to have something, but why is it that the church out there doesn't expect themselves to be expected by others to have something to offer. Well, we all have to have something to contribute whenever we gather together, even if it's just your lively, charismatic presence there. It may not be a vocal gift or a 
song or something, just your lively, charismatic presence there can be a blessing to people around. Amen. Rather than someone who's always discouraged. So really, I'm not preaching to anyone right now, I don't guess, because we don't have any problems with people in the church right now. The Lord has been bringing us to a new place of, of unity and love together. Uh, then over in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. One soul. All the people were as one person, just like husband and wife, Genesis 2, Matthew 19, become as one here the whole church became as one soul. In other words, one person. That's 1 Corinthians 1.10. They all had the same outlook on everything and the same views concerning everything. And therefore, they came together as one large soul, or we could say one large person. No little differences and distinctions between people because of what they wore that day or because of what they were doing. Neither said any of them, None of them were greedy, possessive, covetous. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. No possessiveness. You see, 1 Corinthians 13 shows us that love's not possessive like that. Love is not afraid of losing something and therefore having to cling dearly to it. Love is self-sacrificing. Love surrenders things. Love doesn't try to capture things and become possessive of them. Love is willing to surrender. That's how you get your loved ones saved, is be willing to let them go and not hold on to them. You hold on to them, and they'll probably never get into the kingdom, but you be willing to let them go. Love will let them go. And then faith will claim them, and God will bring them back in. But you have to have both of these things working together. So all of this unity and this, this love that we see that is to be prevalent in the church, uh, if you look over in 1 Peter 2, all of the growth, the spiritual growth and maturity comes through the anointed teaching and preaching of the Word. It doesn't come any other way. All of that spiritual growth, the longer that you're here and the more that you listen to what's being taught, the, the anointed teaching and preaching of the word, then the more that you grow. 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. Well, verse, yeah, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside. He's talking about the assembly, as you'll see in verse 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Well, where do you get that milk? Well, you get that in the assembly when you're taught. Amen. And Peter's writing back in verse 1 to these various people that are in these assemblies, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, Asia, and so forth. So he says in verse 1, you have to lay aside all of that anger and all of that guile and hypocrisies and envies and all of those evil speaking whenever you come together. And as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. You don't grow apart from the word. The Word is what brings growth. People who haven't stayed around for the last three or four years, that's why they're not growing wherever they are, because they're not being taught under the anointing the milk of the Word, as well as the meat of the Word. Any part of the Word will bring growth. Those of you that are, have stayed are different than you were three or four years ago, and then you were a couple of years ago, and then you were six months ago. And this is something you have to exercise faith in, 1 Peter 2, 2. If you come and desire the sincere milk of the word, you'll grow. That's the promise you can claim. You will grow if you desire the sincere milk of the word. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Over in Hebrews chapter 5. Then he speaks down in verse 14 that to those that are going on to maturity... Strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you can go and grow from the milk to the meat of the word. But it's the anointed teaching and preaching that brings this apostolic New Testament book of Acts charismatic growth in all of our lives. 
And it's the fellowship that the saints have together that brings that freedom and that openness and that true love that we are all to be experiencing. Such as over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13. Fellowship around the Word, fellowship acts too around the <coughs> communion table, fellowship in and through our prayers with and for one another. The teaching brings the growth, the fellowship brings the openness and the freedom and the true love. 1 John 3, verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Right. Now that kind of sounds like that you're kind of to be isolated and secluded within that assembly wherever you are because the world's going to hate you out there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a clear division here between those that hate you, the world out there, and those that don't, the people in the local assembly. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's how we know we pass from death unto life. It's not because of this or because of that or because of that over there, but because we love the brethren. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. He didn't just tell us that he loved us. We can perceive that he loved us by something that he did. What was that? He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in other words, not in word or tongue only. Love in word and tongue, but not in word or tongue only, but in deed and in the truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. And this has been happening around here. We're see, we see so many changes take place. I have seen lately so many changes take place in people's lives. We can't even keep up with them anymore. Uh, there are so many testimonies. A brother or someone gave a testimony about their new car that they got several weeks or several months ago. And, you know, you hardly can, whenever I hear someone's good testimony, I like to go up and make some comment to them about it. But you hardly can because then here comes another testimony. And you forget who got what. Things are happening so fast. But uh, when I found out about it later on, I wanted to go up and see the brother's new car. Praise God. Whenever God does something for one, we are all to enter into that blessing with him. I know what it's like driving something that you could have found something better at a kid's toy department store. It's bigger and it runs a little smoother. To go from that to a new car. If you haven't, you don't know the joy Amen. of that. Amen. And if you're not the one doing it, maybe someone else had that happen to them, you ought to enter into their joy with them. Amen. That's right. You know, even if it didn't happen to me, just to get in with someone else on their blessing, even though I don't get anything out of it, I didn't get a new car out of it, you can get all excited and blessed with them Amen. because you're entering in with them into that blessing that God has given them. And so it's good to keep up with what's happening in other people's lives. It's just that so much is happening, it's hard to keep up with it. You want to go find out some more details about one person's testimony, and here come five more up on his heels. And we can hardly stay up with all of these. Well, what we want to look at this morning, if what we've been saying is true, that our gathering together is so important that it probably is the most important thing, it is the most important thing, the several we spend together here, then we ought to do some study on how we should prepare ourselves for coming together, because to the extent that you're prepared, will the service have any lasting and meaningful effect upon you? As we've seen in our studies early in the book of Acts, the early Christians lived just to be able to meet together and hear the apostles' teaching and worship their Lord. They expected and they got what they expected. They expected and they received a divine encounter with the risen, glorified Jesus Christ whenever they came together. Now, a lot of people don't expect that and therefore don't receive it. But the early church, you just read the first few chapters of Acts, they expected that whenever they got together, something was going to happen. And as a result, something did. You get what you confess. You get what you believe for. You get what you expect. And they lived just to be able to meet together. 
not as most people meet together so you can get enough life to live the rest of the week. But they live just to be able to get together with one another. And hear the apostles' teaching and fellowship with each other as well as with their risen, glorified King and Savior. And as a result, you see all of these dynamic things take place in the early church. So since it's so important, we want to look at some things concerning how to prepare ourselves for our gathering together. The church is not a social function that you can attend like attending the local movie theater. There's more that uh, one has to do in order to be ready. I want to begin over in an Old Testament passage in Exodus chapter 19. Several different things that you ought to have working in your life, in your preparation for the service in order to make it meaningful to you and in order to be beneficial to everyone else in the church and pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing is that we are all to come together with a spiritual mind. Amen. We're all to have a spiritual mind whenever we gather together. Hallelujah. We're to keep our minds stayed on Jesus all day long. Hallelujah. When you wake up in the morning, commit that day to the Lord. Amen. Commit all of your works to the Lord. And Proverbs 16, 3 says that he'll establish your thoughts. Commit all of it in faith to him. Don't try to, just before the service, quickly switch gears from carnal mind to spiritual mind and all of a sudden get your mind on Jesus because of all the things you've been doing that day. Maybe you have been busy. Keep your mind stayed on him anyway. It doesn't really work whenever you try five minutes before the service to quickly shift gears from the carnal mind to the spiritual mind. If you'll keep your mind stayed on him all day long, then you'll be ready whenever it's time for the service. We all have to come together with a spiritual mind. That means not meditating before the service on a whole lot of other things besides just one thing, and that is the service, what is going to take place here. Let's prepare ourselves for that now and forget about everything else Amen. to the side. Whenever you drive here, if you drive a distance to the service, don't engage in worldly, carnal, worthless, vain talk and conversation. If you say anything, then be talking about the Lord and talking about what you're going to be learning and talking about what God has shown you. And if you don't want to talk about that, then just be quiet and still on the way here. If you want to do your talking, talk on the way home. But we've made it a practice whenever we drive here to be quiet. Because if you're talking about this and you're pointing at this and saying, look at that, all of a sudden you forget you're going to church. You're just out on a drive then. And you pull up into church, parking lot, and now it's time to get ready for the service. And you could have had 15 minutes or half an hour. It just takes us a short time to get here or an hour to be quiet before the Lord and to be still before him and not have that restless mind and restless spirit and those thoughts jumping from one thing to another because of all you've been engaged in that day. If you'll be quiet before the Lord as you come, You'll be getting yourself into a spiritual mind, a spiritual framework, and you'll be more ready for the service. Now, here in Exodus 19, <clears throat> just a couple of verses, verses 14 and 15, we see how solemn an occasion it was whenever the people were required to present themselves before the Lord in his majesty. And he required certain things of them. Not that all of the same things are required. One of them was washing your clothes. You don't have to wash your clothes before you come. If you come straight from work, you can wear your mechanic's overalls if you want to, and we'll praise God beside you in your mechanic's overalls. But in other words, what they were uh, being taught here is to come clean, clean before the Lord, not some dirty clothes with spots on it, but to come clean, come spiritually clean. Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, and come not at your wives. And then, starting with verse uh, 16, well, on through the end of the chapter, we see God in his majesty coming down 
he's promised to dwell in the midst of our praises. So he comes down here too. And so you've got verses 14 and 15 that come first saying how the people were required to prepare themselves before meeting the Lord. It's the same thing with, our, with ourselves. Verse 14, we have to sanctify ourselves and wash ourselves with the water of the word and with prayer in the spirit and be clean and be ready whenever it's time to begin. Uh, well, he says, verse 15, and be ready. Most people are caught by surprise in the service. You can ask yourself, have you ever gotten to one of the services here in this church and just felt, as things began, just felt out of place? Probably has happened to everyone. You just felt out of place. It's because you were not ready. That's, that's the one thing. If you've ever gotten here and you just kind of felt out of place, you could tell not only from what you heard, but from your remembrance of past experiences, you could tell that the people around you evidently were seeing something and experiencing something that you knew you could have had if you would have prepared yourself, but since you didn't, you don't have. Have you ever felt that before? It's because you weren't ready. And you knew that you weren't ready. And you probably just felt miserable because it's too late now. So what should you do? Learn from that experience and don't come back like that again in an unready, not ready to participate uh, atmosphere. They were required, verse 15, to be ready against the third day. We'll be ready against whenever it is time for the service. And if you've ever had that experience, especially if you've had it more than once, then you should learn from that to be ready from now on or just don't come because I will feel that and I know that I'll feel out of place just like a sore thumb. You think everyone knows that you're not spiritually minded because you know that you're not then. And if you've had it happen to you, know there's really nothing you can do. It's just too late. You were supposed to be ready before you got there. And you get there and you're just not quite ready and you feel like you're just sticking out like a stoplight because you're just not entering into the blessings that everyone else is experiencing. And you remember past times how you did enter into the blessing, and so you know what you did in order to get to that place, and now you don't have it. One of the most important things is to pray in the Spirit, but not just abstractly praying in the Spirit, but with the intent of being built up and prepared for that evening or for that morning service. And a person that doesn't do this is not going to be in that spirit with that spiritual mind. And that's why you'll feel out of place. Services can be good or can be bad. It all depends on you. It doesn't necessarily depend on us. Because as I say, things can be going great and well for everyone else, but not for you. And you're just trying and striving to grasp, you know, that, that presence of God that you know someone beside you is experiencing. You can tell from the look on their face and what they're saying. But it's just like there's a shield around you, a bubble around you, and you don't get anything, not even the overflow from them. You don't get anything as far as the experiencing the presence of God. It's because you were not ready. They had to be ready in the Old Testament. They had to prepare themselves. There were certain things to do in their preparation to be ready whenever it was time to present them, themselves before the Lord. And the same thing is true with us. We have to come with a spiritual mind. And that's why there's really no way you can do this unless you are living your whole life centered around the local assembly. How could you, when you're so involved in so many other things in life, really come with a spiritual mind all the time? Well, most can't. But the reason they can't is because their life is not centered around the assembly. When I say centered, I mean totally centered around the church, its ministry, its people, its beliefs where it meets you've got to center yourself where it meets you can't live in another state or i guess you can but there's going to be a long drive to get there every time you have to center your whole life where you work you can't work 500 miles from where you go to church it brings a total change and revolution in the person's life whenever they get this message down inside them and begin to practice it identifying themselves with the local assembly in everything that it does and stands for because then where you work and where you live is going to be determined on the basis of where is the church? Where do the people meet? Then where I work, where I live, where I go, where I can shop. Maybe you really like that store that's 500 miles from here. You can't shop there, though, because it's not close enough. 
So everything that you do has to be centered around the local church where it meets and what it believes. That is just elementary. That's just basic Book of Acts Christian life and Christian doctrine that they had to center themselves. That's not a new revelation for this age, or that's not some way out, hard to receive, far out type of doctrine. That's just simple Book of Acts Christianity. That if you're part of the assembly, then you're part of the assembly. You can't be part of the assembly and part of a whole lot of other clubs and fraternities and business professional organizations at the same time. You have to be a part of the church and believe what the church stands for. Then in the second place, another thing to keep in mind in preparing yourself is to come with an open, a free, and an excited heart. A spiritual mind, in other words, doesn't mean just to come in and be real solemn and sober-faced because we go on in the second place to say come with an open and with a free and with an excited heart. Wow. Some people think they're kind of spiritual and they come in, they're all closed up. They just can't flow with everyone else in the same stream that everyone else is in it's because they're not open and free and excited like all the other people are. Yeah. When we all are together, then you know how things can go because that's what God requires of us. If you look over in Acts chapter 4 again, don't let the devil say that all these great services that we've just been having can only go so long, they can't last forever. He'll say that because, you know, you come here and you just had one service after another and you think it can't possibly go on like this. But I want to remind you of Acts 4 that we haven't gotten to where they got to in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. So, you know, I guess that we could say if we'd reached the very height, then, you know, maybe there's nowhere to go except down, but we haven't reached the height yet. So don't let the devil say that there's no sense in being so free and excited because there have been so many services like this lately, you can't possibly expect to have another one. We haven't even gotten where they got in the book of Acts. We hadn't had an Acts 2 experience. We're in Acts 4 right now. We hadn't had an Acts 2. Tongues of fire and a mighty rushing wind blowing through the building. Now, if we haven't gotten that far, then there are still things to look forward to. And those people, those people who had experienced Acts 2 still got Acts 4. You know, they weren't satisfied just with Acts 2 and their service, and we'll stop with a great service like that. Most people would be satisfied. They'd retire the church building if you had tongues of fire and a mighty rushing wind come through it. They'd put it on historic register somewhere for the country's historic buildings to come and visit. Tongues of fire, mighty rushing wind. But they went on till the whole place was shaken. Chapter 4, bring down that historic building. It probably didn't matter because the building didn't matter. It was the people that mattered. Amen, Verse 29, now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy slaves that with all boldness they may speak thy words by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Oh, now let's ask ourselves the question, do you really believe verse 31 could ever truly happen here? Is that just bygone acts 431 experience or are we to believe that Bible days are here again? Uh, there's a big difference in what most people are looking forward to. They look forward to a good rendition from the choir of a certain number. What are you looking forward to? We haven't seen anything like this where the whole building was shaken. I don't know any other way to take it than just believe what Luke said. That when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled evidently in some new and greater way. They already got full of the Spirit back in chapter 2. But now they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And then down in verse 30, uh, what, 3? Speaks of that great power that was upon them. Great power 
that they use to give witness and testimony of Jesus' resurrection because God's grace was poured out so abundantly upon them. For the continuation